All right, here we go, and we have episode number five of Exponential Growth, and I have today Katie Millian, all the way from the Delta Entrepreneur Network. We're really excited, and uh, thank you, Katie, for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I got the pleasure to connect with Katie uh, Saba Sawas a couple of weeks ago. Your session was focused just the entrepreneurship movement here in Louisiana in the South. And you have two more people with you, right? Is it three? We had we had three people on the panel. Uh, a representative, uh, Blake, from the Nashville Entrepreneur Center. And then Leslie, who is with the M- Memphis Epi Center. Um, and our moderator was Eric Matthews, who's with Startco out of Memphis. So a good representation of Deep South. I cover eight states, so I have all of the Delta. So I feel I feel like the South and, and the Delta region was really well represented at South by. That's exactly right. And I was so excited like when you, when you guys start talking about New Orleans, which happens to be a week right after South by Southwest. Then you also host it, and I would love to hear more about that in just a second, the events that you guys put together. And, you know, I'm pretty sure it was extremely successful as well. Yeah, absolutely. New Orleans Entrepreneur Week is quickly becoming a premier place for entrepreneurship and to celebrate entrepreneurship. I love what they're doing down there, taking elements of the culture of New Orleans, which is famous and infamous, and creating that into the entrepreneurial community. It's always a good time when you go down to New Orleans, but during no uh, it's really amazing to see these entrepreneurs that are engaged in the ecosystem talking about their companies and talking about the ways that this city and this community has really built up their companies and built up them as individual founders. That's right. You are in the right place in the right time. And I'm excited to be here, even though, you know, in a couple of months, I'm going to be moving down to I'm actually here in Baton Rouge, but I'm going to be moving to New Orleans. So I cannot wait. So let's go ahead. I uh, have Craig LeBlanc with us today from Legacy Formation the entrepreneurial group here in Baton Rouge and he's going to be taking over some of the questions for Delta and just be be able to share a lot of uh, the activities that you guys are uh, hosting and different events a lot of great things all right thanks again Katie for uh, joining the show uh, I get well let's go ahead and jump in and maybe tell us a little bit of background of yourself and kind of why you do what you do and absolutely so I am a Delta girl through and through I was born and raised in Arkansas went to uh, college in Mississippi and then ended up moving back here for undergrad and have stayed and kind of got involved in the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem early on. I worked for a small education startup that was disrupting um, education by teaching high school sophomores and juniors entrepreneurship skills and public service. And so how do you take entrepreneurial skills, soft skills, those soft skills, and integrate that into any kind of career path you want to go into. But also, if you want to be a public service a servant, how do you start thinking entrepreneurially? How do you start taking risk and being innovative in systems that don't always let you do that? And after that, I was in the political circuit a little bit and then uh, came out on the other side and ended up at Delta Regional Authority, which is where I am currently. And DRA is a federal state partnership. So we act a lot like a federal agency and have all of the great programming like a federal agency, but a little more flexibility because we work directly with the governors of our eight states. We have from Southern Illinois down to New Orleans and then a part of Alabama known as the Alabama Black Belt. Right. So um, I, I like to call DRA really the marriage of my other two kind of former lives. And I'm the director of small business and entrepreneurship. So really my role is just to help entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship support organizations, which we define as any nonprofit or individual that is providing free or low-cost services to entrepreneurs. How do we connect them? How do we help build the ecosystem? Because, you know, New Orleans gets a lot of credit, as they should. They have a great ecosystem. But so does Baton Rouge, and so does Memphis, and so does Jackson, Mississippi, and so does Little Rock. So how do we help all of these communities come together and talk about what they're doing and share kind of the war stories so that entrepreneurs reap all of the benefits and how do we connect entrepreneurs to services and making sure that you know the entrepreneur in you know Jonesboro Arkansas is not missing out on services just because he's not in New Orleans 
So essentially, y'all kind of help the organizations that help entrepreneurs. Yeah, absolutely. We built the Delta Entrepreneurship Network, which aims to identify those organizations and those entrepreneurs to create a cohesive network. So we want to make sure that we're connecting all the entrepreneurship support organizations to one another and also educating them a little bit on the the federal resource and the foundation resource side. You know, federal resources can be really tricky in navigating those grant cycles can also be really difficult. So helping them learn some of those tricks of the trade has been really helpful. And we've seen really successful grants in, in from those entrepreneurial organizations come out of some education sessions that we've had with them. Now, obviously, I've gone to a few large conventions where there are actual entrepreneurs themselves there. Do you all have any interaction aside from the conventions where you go directly to the entrepreneurs or offer them something? Yeah, absolutely. So our the Delta Entrepreneurship Network that I was talking about just a minute ago actually has a competitive fellowship that allows entrepreneurs from all over the region to have access to the NOE stage. So for New Orleans Entrepreneur Week, if you're outside of Orleans Parish, like you guys in Baton Rouge or in Lafayette or Shreveport, it's really difficult slash nearly impossible to be able to pitch your company at NOE. And so what the Delta Entrepreneurship Network does is we host pitch competition semifinals throughout the region. They start in the fall and we select a cohort of entrepreneurs, 22 in this last class. And we're looking for about 25 in this next class to attend NOE. And in that, in their fellowship year, they also receive technical assistance. So we did branding and marketing, investment, pitch development and business development with them to make sure that they were not only ready for NOE, but ready for what happened within the next year and all the connections that they were making so they could really scale their companies. Now, have you ever participated in maybe judging some of those competitions yourself or? I have. Yeah. I am, I've been a serial entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneur judge. So, and I love it. It's great. I think it's so brave. I, I have so much admiration for anybody who can get up there and talk about something that they're really passionate about because it's really scary yeah. and it's hard to hear that, you know, your idea or your company isn't perfect. And so, but it's, that's amazing to be able to do part of that and to hear these entrepreneurs share the stuff that they're really so passionate about. But I am, I will say, and you know, just beware. I am a tough critic, so, mm. <laughs> but always willing to help. You know, as a tough critic and a, a, a serial judge of entrepreneurs, why don't you tell us, give, give our audience some, uh, some pointers and some keys that if they're going up in front of you, what do you look for in a good pitch? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is authenticity. I see so many entrepreneurs try to be who they're not because it's on brand for their company. And the thing is, is like, if you hate going up and pitching, I can tell. And everyone in the audience can tell. And there's a difference in getting over stage fright and becoming more comfortable and putting somebody up there just because they're the founder. And, I, you know, I've seen some really wise founders bring on other people that will go up and be that pitch person for them because they can't do it. They don't want to do it. It's not in their wheelhouse. And that's a smart play, but being authentic is really important and making sure that at the end of the day, you're not so in your head about remembering all of the stats and figures that you lose that because really what any investor or what any judge or any customer is looking for is a way to connect. Why do I want to use your product or service or why is it relevant in my life? And, and I think authenticity plays a lot into that. Right. You know, what I've seen in entrepreneurship is that certainly communication is a, is a tremendous soft skill for an entrepreneur to have, but it's not always critical to the founding of the business. And so maybe on some of these pitches, like you said, it may be good to find someone in your organization that can really just do a good job of the pitch, communicating, you know, maybe the opportunity to investors, but how do you balance between those two, between authenticity, this is the guy that eat, lived, and breathed this product, you know, he created it, he died for it, and somebody that's just a hired gun, at what point do you say, you know, I'd rather have more authenticity and less presentation? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a tough balance. I think first and foremost is if you are going to bring, if you're going to let someone else be that pitch person as a founder, they need to have already been 
been bought into what you guys are doing. They need to be bought into the mission and vision. They need to be all about the company. They need to be already on board, essentially. So that way, that telling of the story or that relaying of this is who we are as a team and this is who we are as a company ingrained in them. I think it would be really difficult and very detrimental just to hire a Toastmaster just because they're a Toastmaster. And the thing is, is even people who aren't, even founders who aren't great at pitching, but love their company and love talking about their company and are really, really passionate about that, that shines through. I mean, you don't have to be Barack Obama to make a good pitch. You don't have to be a professional you know, speech maker, you just have to be bought into the vision. And I think that that's the biggest thing. And and I think that's important for all team members early on, because man, those days are long and that pay is little. So you need to make sure that everybody that you're bringing into the fold is really bought in to what you're doing until you can really build it out and start hiring people that, you know, maybe are a little less invested in the vision. So how much do y'all look at, say, you know, aside from authenticity, but look at maybe the team dynamics or the product itself, or maybe the financial stability? What are, give us some pointers on maybe some of those issues that you look at as a judge. Yeah, I think, well, and it varies for each competition. So you, you know, you have to know your audience. So for a 60 second competition, you know, like a G gone in 60, it's really just about the value of the idea. And that's such a gut reaction that that's kind of an unfair thing to judge because for me, then it's, it's just like, oh, do I like that idea or do I not? And there's not really, that sounds terrible, but there's not really a way to quantify that. But for more formal you know, very in-depth, very intense competitions. We absolutely look at the team dynamics. You know, I want to see, especially if you're talking about them, I want to, and talking about your board, I want to see that you've brought on a lot of diversity, diversity in gender, diversity in age, diversity in industry sector, diversity, diversity in race. I want to know that you're building out a team that is going to be able to guide your company to be the best that it possibly can. And if you're surrounding yourself with people who look and think and are in the same industry as you are, it's really difficult to have that. And so that one dynamic that we look at, and you know, we also understand that six months in and you have two advisory board members there, it's not going to look completely diverse, but knowing that you have a plan for who you want to engage on those team dynamics and, and even saying, being honest about your team dynamics, saying, we're looking to hire these three people and we're looking for someone who is engaged and interested in our mission and has a, a lot of experience in this sector. I like to hear that a little bit and I, because it to me that says, okay, not only do I know what role I need filled next, but I know who, what type of person I want in that role. And I think that's, that's important for the short-term vision uh, of a company, especially in those really tough first three years you need to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people you know you need to pad it as much as you can and good team members help do that and in terms of financials you know we i think especially for investors they talk we all talk so much about investing in a founder more so than an idea but that's very very true i want to see that your company has been fiscally responsible with the capital that it has gained, even if it's from friends or your family uh, or Kickstarter, whatever it is, I want to see that that money was taken and invested into the company. Some of the best and harshest advice I've heard from an investor is that if they've seen that you've gotten any type of capital, they don't care if it's $2,000 or $20,000 or $2 million. If they've seen it and it's all going to overhead and it's not going into And it's all going to salary and, you know, expenses to South by and expenses to Silicon Valley and expenses to New York. And it's not going into the product development. They won't invest. And I, I, it's harsh, but it's true. We want to see that these companies are on the path. And for me, it's not as much the amount of money that they've already raised. It's about what are they doing with what they've got. You know, maybe you can speak a little on how, because you know, I put my guys in front of actual investors, and so pitching to a for a prize at a, at a competition is, I think, drastically different than p- 
pitching to investors who have follow up questions and meetings that yeah. if you're faking it till you're making it kind of thing, that's going to be uh, revealed. And then you're caught with maybe you didn't present something or you presented something a little stronger than it actually was that's going to flesh out. And that's where your honesty and, you know, really comes into play. But how how would you say you would pitch a little differently to the investor who has more of a long a long meeting with you or follow up meetings versus like a pitch at a competition? Well, I think, I think you said it perfectly in a, in a pitch competition. You can, you can afford to be a little glossier. You can talk about, I'm not saying exaggerate, but you can talk about all of the, the hype and the pretty parts of the company. And, and that's the part that we as community members like to see too. I mean, no one wants to see, a three minute pitch and then talk about, Oh, well, you know, we had three advisory board members and they all dropped out. That's not engaging. That's not fun. Pitch competitions are meant to be fun. I mean, they're meant to test you and get you comfortable with talking about your company, but there's usually a prize or, uh, they're meant to spark engagement and an investor pitch. It's just, it's so important to be completely honest and very real about where your company is in the pitch. You know, saying that, I think it's so very important not to air out all of your dirty laundry at the beginning. And so navigating that and having a handle on the things, maybe the red flags that you see in your first year or in the next coming up year, knowing, okay, these are the things that my company is going to face and I, I need to be prepared to answer those question, questions about that is really important. The biggest thing is put yourself in the investor's shoes. I mean, if you were going to invest your money into a company, what would you want to know? And what would make you, how truthful would you want someone to be with you? And the answer is usually always, well, I, I want to know everything about their company and I want them to be very, very truthful. And I think that's just a respect. It shows a, an immense amount of respect for people's time and they're doing and their, their hard earned money just to acknowledge that by saying these are, these are the things that are going really well in the company. This is the hard and fast truths. And then, you know, when they ask that mic drop question of, okay, well, what are, where is your company struggling? What are the things that I should know if I was, you know, you're a board chairman, be ready to answer that and be ready to answer that truthfully. The biggest thing is just do your homework, know who these guys are, know what types of companies that they've invested in, know what the investment um, ecosystem looks like in your community. Know, you know, if you're in Baton Rouge, are most people investing in in biotech are most people because of the hospitals are most people investing in oil and gas and and know that information and that's that's just having a lot of conversations with people in your ecosystem and make sure that you're getting feedback from mentors that you really trust because sometimes it can get really overwhelming the amount of good advice and so being able to sort through that and figure out what's right for your company and what's right for you as a founder I think shows a lot of wisdom and maturity in in founders that I've seen so how important would you say uh, mentors and you know business wisdom is to surround yourself by when you're a startup oh I, I mean it can make or break your company I think it's so important it Good mentors are just a wealth of knowledge. And the the great thing about the entrepreneurship community is that everyone is willing to help and everyone wants to pay it forward, especially those that have been really successful. And in saying that, know that everything, I think it's also important as an, as an early stage founder to know just because you're a mentor for had a lot of success, maybe in the same industry, doesn't mean that your company is going to take the same path. Sometimes it's easy to get founder syndrome in the sense of you're like, I have this great mentor. I'm going to be just like him or her. And my company is going to be on the same trajectory. Everything's going to be great. And when it doesn't work out, it it can be disheartening. And and I think founders sometimes start to get down on themselves and, and question who they've brought in. But it's important to know that all the dynamics, you know, dynamics change in the ecosystem from day to day. So just surround yourself with great people, people that want to help, people that are 
maybe not even as tapped the typical mentor in the entrepreneurship city, just bringing people in and making sure that there's wisdom and knowledge about strategy and about the direction of your company and about your product and about your brand, it's really important. And good advice is sometimes hard to take, but be willing to listen and be willing to learn. And that's the best advice I can give any entrepreneur. What would you say are some of the key components that a young entrepreneur founder should look to add to his company? If he's the founder, idea, you know, maker, the scientist, so to speak, what other components, maybe like operations or, or CFO level, that you should say, hey, make sure you get somebody on your team that can do this skill set, this skill set, and this skill set? Yeah, I think, well, and this is a little industry specific, but one that shocks me is that, you know, I, I hear some ideas for apps, and they're great ideas for apps. And then the next slide on their deck is, we're looking for someone to develop this app. And if you know anyone, contact da 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 And I get that that's part of the process, but also if you have this great idea for an app, before you start pitching it, you should maybe find somebody that can actually do the app to see if it's even feasible. So I think if you're in technology and you want to do some type of highly scalable tech startup, you need to make sure that you have a great tech team on board. Just making cheap marketing. Marketing is a big thing that I think often times goes overlooked, making sure that you have somebody whose sole purpose on your team is to push out the story of your company. Because as a founder, I think young founders often underestimate the amount of times that they have to tell their story. And as they get into fundraising and chasing down that first capital to stay alive, they lose the time to be able to continually tell that story. And so therefore they lose a lot of traction. So making sure that even if it's not a, a CMO, just making sure that somebody on your team has the story down and knows and should be able to tell the story. I'm all about contingency plans. <laughs> so uh. I'm a big believer in your people, early, especially early stage when there's not a whole lot of layers to your company, make sure that your team really knows what's going on and has a feels comfortable talking about it because you never know what situation you'll be in where you have to send a team team, team member to an event and that event t turns out to be the deal breaker and that team member wasn't the founder and couldn't talk about it and what a missed opportunity right. so i think the biggest thing is yeah make sure you have somebody that can tell your story constantly also make sure you have a twitter and a facebook that is uh one of the things that is a pet peeve of mine. These great companies, st even starting out, don't have a Twitter and a Facebook. And it blows my mind because it's free and it's free marketing. And it's such a great way to not only engage with other entrepreneurs and tell your customers what you're doing, but it's a great way to engage with mentors. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of entrepreneurs tweeting cold at these incredible founders and getting a response. Even if it's just a simple question like, you know, what was the best advice your mentor ever gave you before an investment pitch? That's incredible information and it's all accessible. If, even if you're in beta and you don't necessarily, you're still in idea phase and you don't feel like, oh, I have enough to stuff to talk about on Twitter or um, Facebook, you can always talk about what's happening in the community and talking about ways that you you as a founder or you as a team are engaging in the entrepreneurial community because I think that's also really important. Investors want to know that you're not just on this island of I'm launching my company. This is the only priority. I'm not engaged with the entrepreneurial community and I'm not engaged with the community as a whole because that's not what great companies are made of. And, you know, just for our audience to, to highlight everything Katie just said about having someone that can tell your story. Uh, that's kind of what I do professionally is I can leverage you know, a couple decades of being in business and knowing investors to get to get you the ear of people that you may have to spend the same amount of or the same two decades trying to to get that relationship where it is and how a mentor or someone on your team that has just a history in the community or in that that industry or that world can uh, navigate those waters and get you in front of these people so much quicker than you could on your own just trying to meet them for the first time. 
Oh, absolutely. And that's a great point, which is when people like you offer up help, entrepreneurs should take it. And I hear these horror stories of great who have great contacts and are willing to share them with founders and founders just never follow up. And it's such, it's so tragic. So I hope you are bombarded with emails after this. <laughs> yeah, we, we, uh, traffic is starting to pick up. I see my LinkedIn starting to, uh, light up now, but <laughs> I, I wanted to go back to something you said originally, maybe as one of the last things we could say, but you had mentioned about soft skills, that that's something that maybe you have done or your organization has done. What are some of those soft skills that you, you know, want to highlight for the founder and for these entrepreneurs that they really need to get to developing because they don't come overnight, but, um, that you would say would be critical for founding companies. Yeah, I think the biggest one is learning how to network because it really is an art and everyone networks so differently and it can be so difficult for people that are not inherently introverted. And and that's okay. It doesn't always have to be a schmoozy, you know, happy hour situation, but really creating, uh, you know, maybe if you are introverted, your style is much more um, via email or phone call and creating meaningful relationships as opposed to like myself, who is the ultimate extrovert and loves the schmoozy happy hours and trading business cards and the whole deal. But figure out what works for you and how to turn those happy hours or those emails into meaningful relationships is really, really difficult. And I think it goes back to that authenticity about being who you really are and being willing to share. There's a great article out about how a way to engage those high-level entrepreneurs like the Steve Cases is not about when you say, oh, hey, can I, can we cold email and hey, can we have coffee? But offering up to say, to give something in exchange and for entrepreneurs and, and like, for instance, for myself, I want to learn about different companies. I want to learn about different trends that are happening in the region and entrepreneurs are the people on the ground. So absolutely. I would love to hear about your thoughts and and things outside of just the company that you're trying to launch in exchange for my advice on it. But I think network is the, is one of the the soft skills that I see entrepreneurs struggle with the most, Mm -hmm. especially because we have created around entrepreneurship, this, mystery of the hustle and all hail the hustle and, and honoring the hustle. And the hustle is great. I'm not, I'm not hating on the hustle, but it, it also can get a little um, shallow sometimes when you're constantly working and constantly hustling. Where is the, the meaning in that and the meaningful relationships in that? And I think networking is so difficult for people because it can come off as very fake. And so as you can build meaningful relationships, even with one person, it goes a long way. And the other thing is make sure that when you exchange business cards that you write down, this is just very practical, write down where you met them because that's so frustrating when you know you've met them somewhere and you can't remember where. And while like black business cards and that thick business card paper are really cool and very aesthetically pleasing, it's hard for some of, some of us that are a little more old school that take notes on business cards to see. So be mindful of that at, when you're designing your company's business cards, but make sure they're still on brand. Yeah, and another trick of the of the of the trade, I even kind of describe them in my notes physically, the conversation, what they yeah. were, just to jar my memory. Because there's times when I meet so many people that without that, I would I, I could not even remember our conversation. Oh, absolutely. And if you think you're going to lose somebody's business card, take a picture of it on your phone. I mean, Mm -hmm. you don't have to be creepy about it, but it it just makes, you know, you'll have your phone on you all the time and there's a timestamp on it. So it's like, oh, okay, well, I was on April 5th at 4th, you know, 30 and I was doing this and it does. It helps tremendously. Well, Katie, I think I'm going to put that last piece you said on, on our website because you seem to pitch our value proposition better than we did. <laughs> but, uh, I really appreciate you meeting with us. And, and uh, it's been uh, about 32 minutes. So I think I'm going to let Gabriel uh, hop in on there. But uh, thank you. No, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Sounds great, guys. So we're uh, heading into the last set of this episode. We got the last 10 minutes. So I would love uh, Katie 
to see uh, if any of the people that are listening happens to be here in the area in Louisiana. They want to engage with it, with any of the activities at Delta or with any of the events that you guys are hosting. What's the best way to do that? Absolutely. You can always check out our website at www.d as in Delta, R-A dot gov, G-O-V. You can also contact me directly. My email is K-M-I-L-L-I-G-A-N at D as in Delta, R-A dot gov. That's great. And then uh, are there any upcoming events in the next two, three months that sh we should be aware? Well, uh, yeah, we are actually going to be talking about um, LA uh, Louisiana Startup Prize is happening. Their qualifying events are happening in April and May. So you can check out their website. So we'll be down there um, supporting them. And then our Delta Entrepreneurship Network fellowship applications open up in September. So be on the lookout for more information on that. The first one is is it in Shreveport? It is, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're gonna head out uh, down there okay. just to just to hang out. Definitely, we'd love to connect. But uh, what about the second one? The one that is happening in September. Tell us, tell us more about it. Yeah, the Delta Entrepreneurship Network um, is the competitive fellowship I mentioned earlier that w gives entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship support organizations uh, a platform for to compete at New Orleans Entrepreneur Week as well as technical assistance during their year-long fellowship. And we'll start uh, doing the pitch competition qualifiers in September and throughout the fall. We'll do them all over the region. So as soon as those get posted, they'll be on our website and you'll have full access to sign up. The qualifications for entrepreneurs are you have to be living or working within the 252 county parishes that the DRA covers. You have to have under a million dollars in revenue and you have to have five or less employees. We're not industry specific, so we want to see all kinds of entrepreneurs at our competitions. It's a three-minute pitch, and then we choose three from each location to be part of the cohort. And we also have that application will be opening up for entrepreneurship support organizations. So again, any nonprofit or individual that's providing free or reduced cost services to entrepreneurs in the region is uh, recommended to apply and those applications will go live in September as well. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. You guys, you better uh, get your stuff together and <laughs> ready for September. You've got plenty of time. <laughs> yes, September. Uh, that's good to hear. What about the, uh, what are some of the uh, benefits, especially for these uh, organizations that are part of the ecosystem? You, you mentioned Idea Village. So, of course, that's a, one of the most robust organizations in the area. But there is a couple of, you know, dozens of small organizations that are not necessarily yet in the big spotlight that are doing great things. So, how are they working with you guys? And, and getting that collaboration going. One of the things that we we've seen out of come out of the fellowship with the ESOs is a lot of collaboration, um, which has been really fantastic. And ways that we can that different organizations can help cover more surface area in the footprint. So even if it's sharing resources or doing things, you know, like Skype calls and doing sessions with more rural entrepreneurs, the collaborations that have come out of this have been really beneficial. And what we see with our fellowship on the support org side is these organizations have different specialties, are at different places. Like you said, you know, some of them are, are, are these big nationally recognized organizations and some of them just have a county or two and are still trying to figure out how to navigate funding and, and program delivery. And so by bringing them together and creating both an alumni group and a cohort network, what we've seen is, is that there's a lot, lot of learning and shared experiences and, oh my gosh, don't do that. We did that. That was a terrible idea. Or we, we did that and that didn't work for us, but it might work for you guys. And again, going back to that accessing federal, federal funding, helping those organizations navigate that has been really helpful. We've gotten a lot of really good feedback on that, but also engaging them with entrepreneurs that they didn't even know were in their communities. So we've seen these ESOs be opened up to a whole new cohort of entrepreneurs and, and being able to talk about how do we make our organizations more inclusive. So uh, that's just a little bit, a little sampling, but if you want to know more, you can definitely send me an email. I'd be happy to chat with you about either the entrepreneurship side 
or the entrepreneurship support organization side of the fellowship. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I'm going to make sure that on the show notes here in the podcast, we have all the information from Katie. So that way you can contact her if it, you know any follow up questions. And lastly, just to close, uh, Katie, I know in the in the session that we we got to meet each other in, in South by Southwest, one of the main things that they were talking about was the, you know, that mix between the academia or, you know, universities or colleges working with organizations like Delta or the, this other organization that you guys support. But next week, April 13, there's the Venture Challenge at LSU uh, for the student incubator. There is a $25,000 prize in cash for, you know, the winners. So can you tell us more, how do you see uh, this organization working with young entrepreneurs, specifically students? And, you know, what are some of the benefits for the students? Yeah, um, L- LSU uh, is a great resource and they're doing some really innovative stuff on building um, that entrepreneurial pipeline. And, and that's what we're seeing more colleges move towards is that they're kind of, they're getting out of this old school thought, which is, oh, entrepreneurship lives at the business school and is just something that is pretty but not real. And what we're seeing is that they're saying, no, we need to integrate entrepreneurship into all of our schools. And we need to make sure that our nursing students have some of these soft skills that they're teaching in these entrepreneurship courses, which has been really great. And it's, it's incredibly important to build, build that pipeline early. I think the earlier you can get people thinking I could actually be an entrepreneur, then the, the, that helps make the all entrepreneurs more diverse um, because you have to give people access and opportunities really early on. And I, I think college is one great way to do that. I think community colleges are really stepping up in the entrepreneurship space and glad to see that happening. And you, you know, you start to see even high school level entrepreneurship emerging in the Delta, which is impressive. And you, sometimes it's from small nonprofits. Sometimes it's from things like the East initiative, um, but more ways we can integrate entrepreneurship into school curriculum and the earlier we can do it, the better. That's beautiful, Katie. I really appreciate your time. And guys, there is no better time than now just to be here in the area. A lot a lot of things happening. This event also coming up in New Orleans, Coalition Conference, over 6,000 people coming from all over the world. One of the largest technology conference uh, in the world now. Uh, so I'm excited to be there. We're going to be hanging out on there. If you happen to be in the area, let, let us know. But uh, make sure you connect with Katie and everything that they're doing a Delta. I think it's phenomenal. And I want to appreciate uh, and just thank you guys for what you guys are doing. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me and for all the work you guys are putting into Louisiana. I'm happy to be